All right. Uh, why don't we let everyone in and we can get started? Okay. I'll meet all. And this is what I just did was what I shouldn't have done. I forgot to mute myself on YouTube. <laughs> We're ready to start. We've got one more minute to go, but I'm just going to start talking. So I think we've uh, we're ready. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our third live session of the Going Native Garden Tour. I'm Vivian New. I'm the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I wanted to welcome you to our live tour session today. We have three amazing gardens, um, but let me, let me first tell you about some of our chapter activities that are coming up. Uh, we have a great program meeting. It's gonna be our very first virtual program meeting and that's going to be on May 22nd on Friday, which is our usual time for program. We're just starting a little bit earlier since people don't have to drive. This is going to be uh, basically the same as what we're doing today. It'll be both on Zoom and YouTube. And we'll start, we'll start at 7 p.m. Great program with Jesse Miller from Stanford about maintaining California lichen diversity. Uh, we have Another session, uh, another live session of the Going Native Garden Tour coming up in June. So we are taking a break of a, a couple weeks, but then we'll be back again. This time, the next one will be at a different time though. We figure that now that the weather is so nice and the uh, restrictions on hiking have been largely lifted, people are gonna wanna be outside during the day. So we're gonna do our next garden session in the evening. That'll be on Saturday, June 13th at 7 p.m. Have another great set of gardens lined up for that session. And then we have another program meeting coming up. Uh, whoops, sorry. Got my... I, I, um, and we have another program meeting coming up in June. Uh, at, on June 18th, at, with, it's on Jewel Flowers and it's a talk by Justin Whittle. And we're, we're still working on scheduling more. Uh, this is, sorry, I'm trying to figure out why there's this odd thing about moving the window away because I don't have anything else on there. So I'm sorry, you'll just have to deal with the, that odd little move the window away thing. Um, but we are still scheduling more events. So if you would like to get notified when we have new events, please join our chapters news list. And the address to do that is on the screen right now. But you can also find it by going to our website, which is cnps-scv.org. And now a little bit of logistics. So we welcome questions, but because we have so many people, uh, having you actually just talk in the middle of the, talk, the presentation doesn't work that well. So we have people monitoring chat on both YouTube and Zoom. So if you have questions, please type them into the chat 
and Johanna Kwan, who is our uh, moderator, will be reading them to the presenters at the end of each presentation. And our schedule for today is starting with the Morrow Rumbau Garden with Madeline Morrow. Then we'll be going to the Sharma and Pushkar Hinwe Garden. And then we will wrap up with the city of San Carlos Native Plant Garden. And these times are approximate. We're, we, we are leaving time for questions. And we're, so if you, but that's just to give you an idea of what we're doing. And then one final announcement. So we are actually already quite a bit ahead of schedule because we'll be going into the start of the gardens after this is I just wanted to let you know that our chapter nursery is now available online. We aren't able to have people come to the nursery. So we decided to let people order plants and we will deliver them to you. And that delivery service is available between Belmont and San Jose. So please don't order plants if you don't live in that area or have a address in that area where you can get the plants because we won't be able to accommodate that. And if you've never been to our nursery before, it is an all volunteer nursery. We, uh, at this point, we aren't able to take new volunteers, but the people who are working on the plants are all volunteers and all of our proceeds go to supporting the chapter and the tour. And one of the things we will be adding to the nursery, if you have been admiring the GNGT t-shirts in the past, you will be able to buy them at, on the nursery along with your plants and they will be delivered along with the plants. So you will have to order plants, but, or you don't have to order plants. You could actually even just order a t-shirt if you wanted, uh, but there's a $25 delivery, dollar delivery fee for every order. And uh, our site is there at the bottom. It does wrap around, but if you type that entire thing, you will get to the store. You can also go onto our website, cnps-scv.org, and there's a link to the nursery store there. And so at this point, Madeline, if you're ready, I would like to turn it over to you. But I also wanted to mention that the picture on the slide is one that I took one of the first times I visited Madeline's garden. She has these amazing, her garden is amazing, but uh, these irises are there and I was just blown away. So I took a picture of them and there they are. Um, Madeline is actually one of our former chapter presidents and she's uh, been interested in wildflowers since she was in elementary school. Uh, in 1993, she learned about the importance of native plants for habitat in the garden. So she's been working on her current native plant garden since 1995, um, which is the way she became involved with the tour and CNPS. And she has a personal goal of converting every yard to a habitat garden. So Madeline, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can continue with your goal. Thank you. Okay, um, share screen. Okay, can everyone, is my screen now shared? I just wanna um, thank you for giving me this time. We, um, this has been a weird year without the tour and for various reasons, COVID related mostly, the garden is not quite in the same, it's a little bit more unkempt than it would be for the tour, but there's a lot of nice stuff going on it. So my husband took a video. We learned a lot from doing this video. And after the video, I two separate videos showing sort of what's happening right now in the garden, um, and it was taken on May 6th. After that, I have some slides, which I'll go through fairly quickly to show succession, because of course, May 6th is one day and the garden unfolds over time. So here we are starting by the front door. Um, and you can see that on May 6th, we had some grandelia, some poppies. The blue there is penstemon. I have a lot of Clerkia um, purpurea. Dendron was pretty much in full bloom. It's been a nice year for Penstemon. We 
We didn't have to clear the path as much because we didn't have all these people coming to the garden. There's the Fremontodendron, which was like absolutely buzzing with activity. You can see Clerkia quadrivia var purpurea is small, but it has a lot of flowers. It makes an impact. It's the first Clerkia in my yard to bloom. Uh, there's some of the bees, some of the bees. This is Valley Violet, which is done, Ceanothus Valley Violet. That's an early bloomer. And this is my surprise, um, Pearly Everlasting, which came up 15 feet away from where I was hoping it would recede. Some monkey flowers starting in um, May. More Clarkia. And here in the shady area near the oaks, I have a lot of Hookera monkey and monkey flower and the iris are kind of done at in may they're earlier i'm gonna you'll see more of the iris in the slides and we no longer add mulch we just have the oak leaves I planted a few plants of Clerkia purpurea, and as you see, they're everywhere now. This is um, a um, trichostema hybrid, and there's the uh, white monkey flower. The red bud in May, May 6 has pods, not flowers. And another view of the Fremontodendron. Um, Too bad we didn't have more rainy days because some of the flowers show up better on rainy days. Here's an area that's fairly shady where I have hummingbird sage. This is the oak border and a red bud that's very shaded now. It doesn't bloom a whole lot, but it sure does have pretty leaves. Okay, so now starting from the other side, oops. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. I forgot. This is a view of the other side of our front yard. We're a corner. This is the dry corner of the meadow starting from here. And the lupin, which came up profusely, is in seed pretty much on um, May 6th. There's a few scattered blooms left of the lupin. Some of the, gra the grasses are in starting to go in flower. That's the um, festuca rubra, the blue-eyed grass, which was covering the meadow earlier, is still here, but it's starting to fade. And we have blue flax. I'm so glad they came out with that sign. That lots of blue flax here, a few lupins left, some poppies, and a few of the Grindelia hirsutula, um, hairy gumweed, um, starting to open. They'll be one of the mainstays of the early summer garden. And there's a whole mass of Clark, well, here's some Clarkia purpurea. And there's a whole mass of blue flax, blue flax, western blue flax here, which it loves clay, it loves that heavy clay meadow. This is a mix of solidago, goldenrod, and epilobium, and the solidago starting to bloom. I don't know why my husband was dwelling on a few of the non natives I have, but. That's it with the toy on in the background. The milkweeds are up. They're started in bud and we had a lot of gopher damage. This bare dirt you see is from this infestation we had of gophers. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, comes up there. I think I'm gonna have to mulch it. Manzanitas no longer blooming in May, starting to form their fruits. That's a Berberus um, pinata, deer grass, more of the blue-eyed grass. 
You see, I have a lot of blue-eyed grass. It, it also is a clay lover. It loves my meadow. And it's still, and there's some of the Grindelias starting to open. They're going to be a lot more. This is a plant that, and this is Arctostaphylus winter glow, an absolutely beautiful low growing manzanita. Uh, not, a lupin just just faded. Salvia terra seca. Uh, there's a little hookera there. I think that's Canyon Delight. And we're coming back to the front door. Some juncus by the fountain. And here we are where we started. Okay. Oops. So that was a video of just a few of just of one day. And I just wanted to go quickly through some things to show succession. Madeline, it's yes. Johanna. Yes. Would you like to um, try to do more full screen? We can see your desktop. Oh, I shared the wrong thing. I'm sorry. It's okay. Is this better? It's okay. So this is starting in uh, February. I took a few pictures in February. As you see, to me, the winter garden is about green and and the structures of trees. Um, then we have in February we have the manzanita flowers. This is actually from a couple years ago because on an overcast day they show up so much better. This is um, Lewis Edmonds by the uh, front walk. And here it is on February 25th, February, well, no, early February of this year. This is um, Arctostaphylus uh, Pajaro Sunset and um, another beautiful manzanita. And this is a little low growing one. This is um, winter glow, which I showed you before, but here it is in bloom. And now we switch, these are photos that were taken um, in on April 21st, about two weeks before the video. And you can see the extent of the blue eyed grass at that point. Here's a close up of blue eyed grass. I absolutely love it. It's a little iris relative. At that time, there was also a lot, there were not flax, flax in the foreground, blue-eyed grass in the background. And then at that point, the lupin was still pretty much in full bloom, mixed in with a little clerkia. And here we are, this shows some of the same views. Um, 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 on, this was on May um, 13th. Well, actually, May last week, where there's a lot less blue eyed grass and the grasses are the brass flowers are more prominent. And of course, the manzanitas have stopped blooming. Here's the lupins uh, now gone to seed. The milkweed is about ready to bloom. This was the my red bud, my best red bud in on April 21st, the end of its bloom. Here it is last week with the pods, very prominent. You can see the pods up close, they're beautifully purple. This is, and here's that front walk that we saw in the, um, that we saw in the video from, you know, last week, um, a somewhat different mix of flowers. This is some of the earlier flowers. And here's what we, 
where we have the Shasta sulfur buckwheat and some penstemons. The, when the Fermentodendron was in full bloom. And also in April, it's April, we have the hookeras. And March and April is really the time of irises in my garden. For various reasons, I don't have any flowers from March, I pictures from March. So really these photos sort of are the end of the iris season. Here's the Clarkia and the Shasta sulfur again. So here's a selection of some of the irises I had on April 21st. Some of them are a little at the end of their days. This is one of my favorites. And this is the view last week of that area where there's a lot more Clarkia. There's the penstemons are still going and um, but the coyote mint and the um, grandelia haven't opened up. This, this is my berberis um, nevini, this uh, berberis from Southern California and it's in bloom. It's a very hot location. It really thinks it's in Southern California. So I also have uh, white sage salvia apiana. And so this is from last week, you can see that the um, the Fermentodendron is at the tail end, but even with a lot of the flowers starting to close up, I think it's still beautiful. And I sort of think of May as the Clarkia show. This is Clarkia ungulata, elegant or mountain Clarkia. I used to have a big mix of both this Clarkia and the larger flowered Clarkia amoena. But for whatever reason, Amoena isn't reseeding like it used to. But I have a lot of this Clarkia. And of, now it's, of course, the time of the monkey flowers. And this is my um, Trichostema hybrid Midnight Magic. I know the nursery doesn't sell this anymore, but I've killed about five Trichostemas in my yard. And this hybrid is the first one that survived. So. I like it. The Grindelia now is starting to open. You can see some of the buds here and with their peculiar little bristles. And the, when you look at them close, they have, they have sparkle with some kind of sticky substance, which is why they call it gumweed. And there's coyote mint in the background in bud hasn't really started. Here's some coyote mint under my blue oak starting to open. It'll be covered with flowers for the first part of the summer. And the other thing that happens at it mid to late May is that the uh, holodiscus starts blooming, the cream bush or ocean spray. And it's a plant that likes shade. It's happy under these oaks. And um, it blooms more every year. And this surprise, my pearly everlasting, that came, this came up when it didn't recede where I wanted to. Plants, annual wildflowers certainly have a mind of their own. For example, this, which is Facilia californica, the desert Facilia. I had it growing in a pot on the front porch. It reseeded there for a couple of years and that petered out, but I was surprised pleasantly surprised to find it growing here by my dry creek bread and I'm hoping that it will like this hot dry area and continue to recede. And I we didn't do any video in the back. It has a lot of issues for an overall walk, but there's some nice plants back there. This was earlier in spring. This is my Vaccinium ovatum um, in bloom. It's a not a super showy bloom, but it's just a it's a beautiful little plant tail end of the iris. And here in May, the Carpenteria is blooming, which is such a, you know, I always associate this sort of with Memorial Day. Here's a close up. And right now to the um, Seaside Daisy, a rigor on, this is um, Wayne Roderick is in full blast with for later color, there's an epilobium and a grindelia camporum. And my bush poppy that I have in the back is blooming its full head off like it usually does. 
We didn't prune it last year, but it uh, gets a little untidy, but it's the flowers are beautiful. So, And this is the bush lupin, which is a kind of untidy, unruly plant that comes up where it wants, but it is a great host plant and the flowers are gorgeous. And here's some hookara and monkey flowers. I had a monkey flower here that did not come back, but I have little reseed monkey flowers coming up all over. It'd be interesting to see what color they are. And also starting now, the elderberry is starting to bloom and it's showing over the creek dogwood at the bottom, which is done and starting to form berries. And this is just a little surprise, not the greatest photo, but this is a wind poppy that came up in my backyard and I just love to see it. And another surprise how big the stream orchid is, although I think that might be related to some irrigation issues we had. <laughs> so uh, that's all I have. Are there questions, Joanna? Yes, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Here we go. First question, um, first of all, you have an admirer of your garden. Um, are the oak leaves okay to have in lieu of the mulch? The leaves are pretty sharp and they worry about um, them, you know, and maybe cutting them smaller. Well, in the garden beds, I don't worry about that. Um, we do typically blow the pads and and I know I I actually remove some and put them in the um, city waste. We get so many because they will actually pile up and smother plants. I think in the wild they disperse better, but with fences and things, they tend to pile up in places. Um, I don't walk on the beds that much, so I I don't worry about it and they become less sharp over time. We have used oak leaves as mulch on our garden, on our vegetables, and we ran th those through, um, the blower will actually shred things and we did shred them for mulch there, but um, I don't worry and for the whole yard, I'm not gonna um, shred them from mulch. I don't think it's necessary. I, but I clear, clear them off the paths. Thank you. Um, how did you discourage the gophers from inhabiting your yard? Um, there's a guy who does live trapping, no pesticides. It got really bad. I was waiting for them to move on, but I decided they were going to like trash all my paths. So he went in and did some trapping. He said there's a population explosion this year because his theory is the warm winter. So we have plenty of gophers. I will, um, I, well, I mean, lethal trapping. I, I think um, since we don't have as many predators as we used to, I have, a, I have someone trap them and kill them, so. Okay, a few more questions. Okay. Uh, did you have to water your meadow in February when it didn't rain at all? We had the watering on like every two weeks. We kind of keep it on in the winter. I mean, I, I don't know, we had a light, very light watering schedule just to make, because if we turn it off for long periods of time, things tend to clog up and it, it did okay. Also, we had it on because we were gone for much of February and we didn't know what would happen. So we had some light water coming and then it rained, it rained some in March, which made things look great. All right, thank you. Um, your irises, are they mostly the PCH? Or? Yes, my irises are all PCH hybrids, except for one of which I didn't have a photo of, which is C Canyon Snow, which I have in the back and um, which is what, which is I think a, just a straight up selection of Iris Douglasiana, I believe. But no, they're all PCH hybrids. Um, I love PCH hybrids. And also since I don't live near a wild area, 
I have pretty, you know, basically this is a very suburban garden. I don't worry much about hybrids um, messing up the gene pool because I'm not close to any place with wild plants. Thanks. I uh, just want a quick reminder for those um, who are joining us or just joining us. Um, Madeline had just shown us her garden video and photos. We're taking questions via chat if you'd like to ask them and I'm going to go with the next question. Um, the stream orchid, does it need to grow in a wet place? It does need some moisture. Um, we have it in essentially a drainage ditch in the back of the yard and um, where the, the whole patio is sloped when we have rain, it, it slopes down to this area. So it gets wet there. It is, there is where the stream orchid is, there is some irrigation coming down. It's particularly large this year because we had some issues. We have a pond, a fish pond back, a small pond back there. And there were some issues with the valve and I think some water was, some, it was, Overflow water was released when it shouldn't have been, which is just terrible. But that's why we have so much. Other years, it's not quite as lush. But pretty, there is there is some irrigation there, but it also collects water. It's in a place that collects water during the winter. Thank you. Next question. Could you please say the name of the white flower um, it's on a bush tree that you mentioned before okay, the bush poppy. Yeah, the white flower is Carpenteria californica. I will type it in the chat in a minute. And um, I guess the common name is, in fact, I have my plant list here, but I think the common name is like California bush anemone. And the variety is Elizabeth, which is what's commonly available in the nursery trade. And I don't know if we have a lot of it. I haven't checked the inventory, but we frequently have it in a nursery. Our nursery, it's available other places as well. Carpenter, okay, I'll type it in now. And I, this is Vivian. I just wanted to say we have quite a lot of it in stock at the nursery right now. <laughs> it's a gorgeous plant. I have a lot of them. And if you could see in the chat, um, you can reach our nursery store online and uh, order plants for very local delivery. I'm just seeing this question is chat. Yep. What is your most and least favorite plants in your garden? Oh my God, that's like asking what's your favorite kid. Um, I know, I mean, I have to say that the Fermontodendron, you might qualify that as my, my most favorite plant um, because essentially I designed the whole front yard over having a place for a Fermontodendron. It's absolutely stunning in bloom. I like it even when it's out of bloom, even though, you know, you have to make sure, you know, you have to prune near it with gloves and you really, you know, because the leaves are kind of prickly and the little dried up flower buds are even more prickly. So it's good not to have this too close to a path. And um, it absolutely hates summer water. So you have to give it a place. I killed like three of them before I finally figured out how to, how to keep summer water off of it. Well, I got more control over my irrigation. And my least favorite plant, I don't know, it's my least favorite plant. I don't have too much of it anymore, but my least favorite plant is Oxalis. Oxalis pest capri, that damn Bermuda buttercup. And miner's lettuce, I like and I don't like. I planted some for the vegetable value and it's, um, it's a bit of a thug, but I can't say I really hate it, but 
I would just say use with caution. Okay, Madeline, the last question we got for you, I believe, is the Fremontodendron the Ken Taylor? Um, yes, it's Ken Taylor. And in my garden, I'd say it's performing as advertised. It stays about four and a half feet high. It's gotten a little wider than advertised. Um, but we have done some judicious pruning with, you know, sending up offerings to the gardening gods before we do it, but it's, it's stayed healthy. Um, yeah, and that's like a small Fremontodendron. So just, just saying for people who are considering it, the species is huge. And I saw one, I was driving around Campbell early on in, when I'm in, in like my first year in California and I saw a house that had a huge Fremontodendron that was almost up to the second story. I hit it when it was in full bloom and it was like, oh, that's the plant I saw in books. And that was like, that started my quest. I had to have a Fremontodendron in my yard. Speaking of Fremontod, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Speaking of Fremontodendrons, um, how long do those flowers last? And then are do they last longer than the irises and bloom for 10 minutes? Well, you know, I would say the Fremontodendrons start, they don't all open at once. So my, I saw my first Fremontodendron flowers opening in February. Just a few. It's probably in, was in full bloom. Um, it was in full bloom in um, the beginning of, beginning of April. I'm trying to remember, it depends on the year. So really you get, I would say you get a solid, um, depending on the weather, two to four weeks with significant bloom. The, but I have to say, you know, about the plant is it architecturally and, you know, it's, it's got an interesting shape and the leaves are absolutely gorgeous because almost no plant blooms all the time, but Fremontodendron works well as a focal point because it never looks bad unlike some plants that look bad when they're not in flower. It's not quite as, it's not quite as um, charismatic as manzanita, which looks good at, in all, really fantastic in all seasons. But Fremontodendron as a focal point will not make you say, Ugh, why did I plant that? And irises can, the thing with irises is you want to have a lot of different varieties because they all have their own schedule. And I have irises for like a two month period because I have a number of different varieties and in different, um, in different shade locations, some with more sun, some with more shade. So I get a really long season where I have some irises to look at all through February, March and into April. Oh, any plants I have not been able to keep alive in my garden. Uh, the species Trichostema. Um, I can't get Phacelia to reseed unlike almost everyone else in the world. Or I can't keep um, Columbine, blanking on the scientific name. And I don't even know, well, the thing is Saratoga covers a lot of territory. I don't live in the hills. I live in sort of the run up to the hills and I have heavy clay. So a lot of what I say is applicable to probably, my yard probably has a similar habitat to many places, although I think we're hotter than say Los Altos and places like that. Um, so a lot of the coastal plants, I got to be really careful with. My yard's pretty hot. I have trouble with um, Areogonum latifolium, the coastal buckwheat. It's very hard to find a place in my yard where it's happy. But clay loving, I've, so I've been finding clay loving species like Grindelia, like blue eyed grass. 
iris are very adaptable and I have a lot of those. Oh, okay. Maintenance on the meadow. Um, the meadow is a lot lower maintenance than it used to be. Um, probably it needs some weeding attention once a month. I actually, I'm, and we get help because of some of my, you know, my arthritis, but I think some of the gopher turned areas should be mulched or I may get, um, I'll probably get weeds in there if I don't do anything about it. And the yellow, and the yellow flowered plants in my background are, they're a summer, a mainstay of my summer yard, Madia, another clay, Madia elegans, another, it's called tarwi, which is such an ugly name for a really beautiful plant. And there are another um, clay loving species and they coexist well with grass. So I have a lot of them in my meadow. I have a lot of them that come up all through the yard, but of course you didn't see them in any of these photos because these are late winter to spring pictures and Madia is a summer bloomer. It's pretty amazing. The only thing, you know, it closes in the middle of the day, but the th when you go out in the morning or in the evening, you see Madia flowers and that's okay for me because in the summer, I don't particularly spend a lot of time out in my meadow in the, at, in the, when it's, you know, 90 in the middle of the day, but they're beautiful and they attract a lot of pollinators. And they reseed readily. That, that was in a wet year. Sometimes they're only about a foot high. If they're in a place with really good soil near irrigation, they get bigger, but they're always gorgeous. And their leaves kind of smell like pineapple. Well, thank you, Madeline. I believe that's um, all the questions that we've received so far. Um, once again, a uh, reminder for those just joining us, if you have questions at any point, please enter them via the group chat. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Vivian. Thank you, Johanna. And thank you so much, Madeline. Amazing garden that you have there and really appreciate all your insights about your choices and the challenges and the things that worked well. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you again. So our next garden is the Sharma Hingwe garden. I think it's actually new to the tour this year, so it hopefully they'll they'll stay on the tour so that there'll be a, a physical chance to go and visit. But we have an amazing power couple who have created quite a wonderful place. And uh, Mina Sharma is an architect with a master's degree from UC Berkeley, and she's currently an elementary school librarian in Cupertino. And she is the person behind the garden. She uh, uh, is, is also the script writer for the video that you're gonna see first. And thanks to her formal training, the house and garden are connected in both design and theme. She has an eye on sustainability of living and a soft spot for the animal life around us. She makes up for her brown thumb with her grand ideas on sustainable and local designs and her eagerness to act on them. And Pushkar has a PhD in engineering from UC Berkeley. His day job is leading teams that design a robotic surgery platform. And he was convinced by Mina to give up their high maintenance lawn and the convenience of hiring those blow and go mowers, uh, gardeners uh, and plant native flora. So he is the main force behind keeping the weeds in check and keeping the plants thriving and neatly cataloged. So his motto is buy first and think on what to plant later. And they have two kids who have been caught on giving the garden tour message to their friends with, and they're excited, really excited about that. And they've been helping by digging holes for planting and doing other hard labor. And they're also in charge of making the garden benches that are the gathering spots for their family. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Pushkar and Mina. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, uh, th th thank you Vivian for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, I hope everybody can, can uh, hear us. Um, right, it's a it's a delight and a privilege to be a part of the garden tour. Uh, we are um, sort of um, novices at this and still learning. 
Um, we thought we would prepare a video that I'm going to share. Uh, it is goes through the house. It starts with the front of the house. But what I thought I would uh, do first, now let me share my screen, um, is uh, tell you how the house looked when we um, got it, uh, when we bought it in uh, 2012. So that's almost eight years uh, now. So this is how it looked, uh, lawn, um, uh, juniper, uh, and then I think we uh, did some uh, 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 things to it, um, but mainly um, um, around getting rid of the juniper, we still, um, oops, not, not this guy, and kept the lawn. Um, and uh, so you get an idea of how it was. And so what I would do is transition to uh, the movie now and uh, and uh, the movie is 18 minutes long and we will uh, be available to take questions um, after that. So let me make sure that I have my movie playing. Give me just a minute. Actually, while Pushkar finds out how to get uh, our movie on, I wanted to let you know that we are uh, huge fans of GNGT. And uh, being on the tour, I think, is like one of Pushkar's, uh, you know, those hundred things to do before you die. So we are uh, really um, uh, happy and, and um, thankful that, uh, you know, we actually managed to make the cut to be on the tour. Um, so thank you for, um, you know, for uh, including us in the program. Hello and welcome to our garden, which is quite an eclectic garden with some California natives that we planted about seven years ago and a more planned garden that we had the pleasure of working with Ashini Fernanda and Deva Luna and planted by Earth Care mm -hmm. Landscaping a year ago. We knew right from the beginning that we wanted a California native garden Having embarked on this journey after attending a sheet mulching workshop at Regan's Nursery in Fremont in the early 2000s, and then discovering CNPS and GNGT. I would say this is quite a collector's garden as we cannot contain ourselves when we routinely visit the Tilden Park native plant sale and other regional nurseries. We've learned the hard way that the better time to plant is in the fall. Our front yard is on the north side. This gives us an opportunity to show off many nice plants. Deva designed a symmetrical entry walkway where we created two small mounds to provide interest and have slopes for better drainage. On the left we have a volunteer buckwheat which is doing very well with no water and is surviving pedestrian abuse. The reed grass and the monardella are providing accent and we hope that the manzanita grows to be the main focal point of this corner. Now you see sage, poppy, aerophyllum, and nightshade on this mound, which are providing lovely colors. The idea was to provide symmetry of color and plants on both the sides. However, despite being only five feet away from each other, both the mounds are behaving very differently. Uh, on the left-hand side mound is a buckwheat that we took great care of, but it suddenly died a week ago. That was not all. There was a curly blue ball on top of this mound, and it died late last year. But we took the opportunity to plant a, a rare uh, silver lotus plant uh, that is doing really, really well and has really, really pretty beautiful yellow flowers. The nightshade on this mound is fairly compact, but its sibling on the other side is growing well into its neighbors. The curly blue wall is barely visible, but is still a thing of beauty at this time. Similarly, the area of phylum, yellow guy, is sprawling here, but on the other side, it's fairly compact. On this mound, you can also see Santa Cruz buckwheat, also, uh, further along, you can see a sprawling salvia beast bliss, and it should be sprawling. 
uh, there is also a, a splash of blue white grass here and further along there is another splash of yellow white grass we will come back to this area later but right now let's go back to the front yard again our kids bedrooms face the street and we realized we needed some kind of screening we also like to spend a lot of time in the front yard as it gets great morning and evening sun. Rather than blocking the windows, we decided we'd build a screen of tall, narrow natives along the boundary. The first of these screens is a bush poppy, which is not doing very well. Next comes the mock orange, which is in full bloom now and is doing very well. The Nevins Barberry has sweet and tart berries and yellow flowers in bunches. The chaparral mellow just got planted last year. We hope it will go into a big screen plant. Carpenteria is not happy in this place. Too much sun, too little water. Around the dwarf citrus are, carpent are some fuchsias, bleeding hearts. Lemonade berry was planted last year. And because it grows slow, we propagated mallows. And they have grown in eight months to cloud everything, including the red bud, which is sort of now uh, really getting smothered by its uh, mallow neighbors. We also take care of the median between the walkway and the street. And there we just scattered a bunch of California poppy and blue flax seeds. The poppy characteristically decided to migrate everywhere but the blue flax has really made the medium its home and is spectacular. In the shade of the north wall, Deva suggested we grow junkers, heavenly smelling Indian mint, hedge nettle, and monkey flower. While waiting for the border screen to grow, we still have the issue of privacy for the kids' windows, and we are using decorative screens and hoping native climbers like Dutchman's Pipe and Clematis will make their way onto them. Between them are Bleeding Heart and Ribus King Edward. Deva realized that she needs to leave us room in the front yard to play. So we are growing uh, two varieties of blue-eyed grass. And since Pushka is partial to buckwheat, we have a lot of buckwheat. Behind the buckwheat is an old bird bath that we intend to fill with water for critters in the warm summer months. And here is our very messy mound of fuchsias. We are about merging every year reliably. Just about now is narrow leaf milkweed. Spectacular flowers. And ladybugs love them. We are hoping that the edgeward mallow we planted last year will give this area a perennial focal point. On the other side of the mound is a salvia apiana. Next to it is columbine, which is also very reliable in its appearance every year. We saw the lemonade berry from the other side, uh, crowded by the mallow. And surprisingly, in the foot of narrow, we have a humboldt lily, which has just emerged, almost forgotten about it. Uh, in this vicinity is also soap plant. And a few weeks ago, it has spectacular blue, very, very lovely. Near about in this area is also a uh, showy milkweed. Uh, this is the first year it's uh, coming back uh, after going dormant. We also have in this area uh, a hybrid mimulus and uh, some sneeze weed. This is the first time they're going to sneeze weed, they're also water hungry. This area is also has a bench that our kids made and um, it's a great place to sit in the afternoon uh, in the late spring or even in summers uh, and, uh, and really admire the garden. On the front porch are some planters with Luisias in full bloom and some Dudleyas and sedums that were initially planted in a very sunny spot and we're not happy at all. Let's go back to where we left off before, the deepest salvia and the blue-dyed grass. 
on the other side of this, along the northern uh, wall of the house, you can see area phylum and uh, hollow discus, this color cream bush, which is doing uh, very well. It didn't go deciduous uh, this winter. Wonder why. Then the hedge nettle is uh, really crowding the irises here, which were in spectacular bloom uh, just a couple of weeks um, ago. Here is another view of the hedge nettle. And on the far side, you can see hummingbird sage. Uh, what's curious alongside this path is about three weeks ago, there were about 20 volunteer red buckwheats, and they were doing really, really uh, well uh, relative to uh, this other guy, uh, which is uh, now crowded, getting crowded by the sages and uh, kind of struggling relative to the sages. You can see that this is the black sage with really beautiful uh, white um, flowers on uh, spikes um on the uh, foothills of the sages is a, a spot of california aster with uh, nice plain flowers the artemisia tridentata or sagebrush we have had a very difficult time growing considering it really thrives in the wild uh, it's almost a weed we have a couple of uh, gum plants which seem to be doing well um and uh, this is a costa uh, buckwheat uh, the other guy on the mound earlier had died, but this is doing very well and it has constant visitors uh, of these. This is also a pathway to the mound that Mandalini will talk next about. Our home is on the corner of a busy street and we had been struggling for a way to have a visual and physical barrier. So we created a large mound made of dirt we saved from our home remodel project that we jokingly call Mount Everest. This mound gives us another great place for plants that need good drainage. The street side area of the mound is surrounded by tall bushes like the fennel bush and two fast growing mallows. On the house side, you can see natives that thrive on good drainage like the salvia etiana, the island bush poppy, and dune tansy. In the valley, our salvias and sages we planted six years ago, which are now one big happy mishmash. On the eastern side yard, we were blessed with a beautiful, thriving Matilda poppy bush, which we have tried to contain as it can take over the entire corner, including the fire hydrant. We also wanted to plant more trees and we chose the live oak, the madrone. In the understory neighborhood of the madrone are sedalsia, coral bells, and taking advantage of the shade between the house and the fence, five finger fern. In the backyard, Deva wanted us to have a little more of a painted canvas. So she layered plants using color and size. And you can see the blue penstemon and yellow heterotheca with the monardella on their right. Of course, the poppy decided to bomb the painting Pushkar also wanted some lawn to nap on lazy summer afternoons, and we chose a native red fescue grass. A beautifully sculpted manzanita came with the house, and when it bursts into flower, it is spectacular. Along the fence, we went with more shade-loving and water-tolerant plants, like the ribes, which get beautiful tassel-looking flowers. At its base are two happy hybrid monkey flower plants. And towering over them is a fragrant pitcher sage. <laughs> Panning to the right of the painting, we can see a splash of color from sulfur buckwheat, 
Some common yarrow going wild. A happy orange desert mallow that had a spectacular bloom last fall. And beech aster leading to an existing very fruitful loka tree, which provides us an understory to plant many shade-loving plants. We used part of a pine tree log as a bench for seating and edge our back patio. Under the loka tree are several shade-loving plants. You can see the accent provided by the deer grass surrounding the non-native maple. There is also a string of uh, Aster, and you saw the picture uh, before. There is Dune Dancy, which is aggressively trying to take over the space from the hummingbird sage, which is kind of doing okay. You can see some Eucara Maximus in the back. They're doing very well. On the far side, um, hard to see, but there are low growing manzanitas, and we hope they'll fill up the space. Near about the path uh, is also a string of irises, and they were an expect spectacular bloom uh, just a few weeks ago. Ashini helped us realize the potential for creating another seating area in the corner of our yard under the majestic oak growing in our neighbor's yard. As you walk along the pathway, you are flanked by the yarrow and desert mallow. You walk between a gateway of St. Catherine's Lace and Galvisia to enter what will become a sanctuary. From this nice secluded shady area, we get to enjoy looking back to the main patio area with its sail shade and spiral paving. Interesting thing about the St. Catherine's Lace, the one on the right is thriving, while the one on the left is really struggling. Next to it is some leafy reed grass, mock orange, carpenteria in the back, then what we think is a native azalea, but we're not sure. There's also a toyon that we planted new. Spice bush, another string of alum root, and an existing older toyon, which gets brilliant red berries in the fall that the birds really love. Under it, is dogwood. Some Santa Barbara sedge. Taking advantage of the shade is a leopard lily waiting to be transplanted and a coffee berry in the back. Walking from the sanctuary to the lawn, you see on the left hand side a splash of blue eyed grass a big bush of Cleveland sage, some deer grass, a Dr. Herd manzanita, a verbena della mina, which is doing great, while its brother on the other side is not doing so well, even if it is only 10 feet away. Moving along, there's some more blue penstemon and a sedalsia, which was in spectacular bloom just a month ago. Let's now go to the west side yard of the house. Along the fence, we are growing many climbing natives like the mandroot, clematis, a honeysuckle, climbing penstemon, and mountain mahogany. The side yard is also our nursery where Pushkar carefully collects the volunteers and tries to propagate them. He has had a pretty decent success rate so far. We use leftover pavers to create a lizard and succulent habitat. Not all the succulents are native, but there are a fair amount of native dudleyas. At the end, we leave you with a few more pictures from around the house, like the monkey flowers, some volunteer miners' lettuce, and a goldenrod. Thank you 
We hope you have enjoyed the virtual visit to our garden, which has a mind of its own and tolerates and humors us into believing we have any control over it. Hello, everybody. So that was the that was the video. Thank you for listening. Hopefully, it went uh, okay. It wasn't choppy or in the in the the narration came through. It was amazing. <laughs> I I think we're just in awe. Um, thank you so much. I want to once again remind attendees that we are taking questions. Uh, via the chat, if you'd like to type them in. Um, you had a lot of admirers, including myself. The, the photo, photography, and the video were amazing as the narration from both of you. Really appreciate that. Thank you. I think there was a confusion in my mind about the deer grass um, and, the, and the leafy reed grass. Um, and so I think I just realized watching the video that I've, I swapped their description. <laughs> it's okay. I think yeah, your timing in the chat uh, was just perfect on letting everybody know. <laughs> I didn't see any questions. Um, like I said, I, I think I know myself, I was just in awe of, of everything. All right, here we go. Um, do you have any plants that you'd recommend for beginners? Um, for beginners? I think our, uh, the Solanum uh, Xanthi, I don't know how, if I'm pronouncing it correct, or the, the purple nightshade, uh, that has been one of the easiest plants to grow uh, when we planted hedge nettle, I was not really sure, but I love it now. You know, it has really filled up the northern border along along the house. Uh, that seems very um, easy. Um, the oh, the California fuchsias uh, are also super easy. We actually have two kinds. Deva insisted that we we she only plant compact ones and i can see the reason why because if they're not compact and the spreading kind then they go really 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 wild um so that's that the sages are super easy i think the cleveland sage is just fantastic um and it you have to make sure that you leave about 10 foot space uh you know five feet diameter around that plant but uh, we have, I think, a couple of them, and it, they are just uh, just beautiful. Thank you. I have a question. Um, are you worried at all about the plants when it comes time to replace your fence? Do you have any concerns? Ah, I do have concerns. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, yeah, Vivian introduced my motto as, you know, uh, plant first and think later, <laughs> or buy first. And um, so we, there might be a time where we'll have to uh, see how it goes. My hope is that, um, uh, um, you know, we'll survive. The man root actually I'm not worried about. It seems like it dies down. Uh, so we have to find an opportune time to replace the fence. Um, the honeysuckles are fairly robust. I mean, if you go walking uh, in, in any of the uh, neighborhood parks of the Bay Area towards the Santa Cruz Mountains and all, they're just growing wild. Um, they, they're pretty hardy. So I'm not worried about really cutting them uh, short. Um, I have no experience with the climbing penstemon or the kekiela, so I, I don't know whether that will survive or it won't survive. Uh, the mountain mahogany also, I don't have an experience about it, but it seems like um, it is a neat uh, sort of a, um, a plant and we're hoping that we can espalier it and because of its neatness, we can probably pull it back. So I don't know, that's a great question. Um, we'll, we'll have to see, I hope that we'll be able to uh, work through it. Great. Uh, along that lines, um, are you going to be removing any plants you think that might be crowding others and follow up? 
no, no, we don't remove plants once they grow. <laughs> yeah, we let let we, the poppy grow. We just grow. move them over a few. <laughs> <laughs> you you can tell that when we planted sages six years ago, we had no clue for how much space to leave. So you know they're all weaving into each other. Uh, we do plan to cut them back. Uh, it is just um, heartbreaking to have to do that right now. So we'll figure out a, 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 the right time to do it. Actually, if somebody has an advice on what, when to cut back sages, um, I'll appreciate it. Yeah, I hope you didn't think I was putting you on the spot. Uh, I, I've had no. the same, <laughs> I have the same problem in my yard. Uh, we, we overplanted a bit, and uh, it's hard to decide who, what to do. Yes. <laughs> okay. You may have noticed the poppies are just everywhere and we can't even, we don't even have the heart to pull out the poppies that are in the pots. We like walk around them gingerly. It's <laughs> <laughs> I love them too. Um, follow up question. How much water does your hedge nettle get? I think there is a, uh, drip there but i think in the summers my plan is to take the drip out completely uh, what i have done uh, occasionally is um, just take the hose and just uh, spray on top i think hedge nettle is probably one of the things that will tolerate wet leaves and won't get fungus i may be wrong uh, but it seems like because it has roots which spread out um, my suspicion is that it likes uh, being wetted in a large area. Um, and I think that seems to be working so far. Yeah, but we did try to zone uh, the plants by their water use. And so there, currently there is a drip irrigation because a lot of them are still establishing. Um, I think once they do get established, we'll have to rethink uh, the way we water them um, so we did try and get one of those smart um, irrigation timers and uh, hopefully we can we can be smart enough to use them and make it work depending on the zones um, that's always been a challenge for us is uh, some most of the time we end up over watering um, and i think that that causes a, a lot of plants to um, to yeah. disappear Thank you. Um, next question. Oh, sorry. Is that good? Yeah, no, no, just I know the red bud and the mallow question. I was just going to ask you that. So go ahead. Oh, what is the question? The question is, are we going to do anything with the red bud? I think that one of the mallow. Yeah, so to we're going to have to um, uh, severely trim the mallow or, or let it go. These are all mallows that came from a single tree. Um, that had fallen over and we had to get rid of it um, and we got rid of it and then in the next spring there were literally dozens of little saplings and so it was very convenient for us to just plant them and they literally started eight months ago with being just a foot or so so yeah i think we are we have to uh, uh either get rid of that the biggest mallow uh, and give uh, the red bud uh, some space and the lemon and berry some uh, berry some space um, that's not that won't break my heart because these things just grow at a wild pace and and they'll likely topple over so before they topple over i think i, I need to um, either reduce them significantly or remove them here's a more generic generic question um how do i find out more about the plants that you're growing and is there a, a plant list there is a plant list on the GNGT. Uh, if you go our garden, which is the Hingue Sharma garden in Los Altos, uh, at the end of the page, I believe you find a plant list. And uh, uh, I think that's one way to do that. I think last two, uh, uh, two weekends ago, there was a nice demonstration on how to export that or cut and paste uh, it into a, a spreadsheet and then uh, populate uh, cals, uh, um, calscape.org uh, plant list with those names. Um, I followed that advice, so now my plant list has several um, uh, garden lists there. And that way you can actually get a nice reminder of um, 
what it looks like. Uh, Calscapes is just an amazing, amazing uh, website um, for for uh, utilizing the plant list from GNGT uh, web pages. Um, it's a little bit work to export it over there, um, uh, but once you've done that, you 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 have the plant list. Right, and Chris, I think just sent the link on how to get there. Right. Thank you, Chris. Yes, okay. One last question, if that's all right with you. Um, yep. Do you see more pollinators and birds visiting your garden now that you have so many native plants? Absolutely. The bees and the pollinators, they are just um, constantly there. And we have seen a huge rise in them just within one year. Yeah. Um, birds? I'm not so sure about well, birds. There are lots of hummingbirds that come, but not uh, other birds. There are finches and sparrows that come occasionally right. in the morning. Yeah. Um, they seem to thrive on all the seeds that uh, fall off. So um, um, miners lettuce drops uh, seeds. Uh, uh, flax, blue flax uh, drops a lot of uh, seed. And it seems like my guess is that the birds are getting to those kind of seeds there. Yeah, our, our biggest challenge is our cats. Um, th so they, they tend to chase the birds away and uh, which is one of the reasons why we planted the Nevins uh, Barbary uh, because the, bird, the cats can't get to them but the birds really come and enjoy the berries on that. Uh, but especially now um, with, the, with the quietness of uh, less traffic, on our corner house, uh, I can actually hear a lot more of the birds coming in. Um, so I think that has been uh, either I'm hearing better or and they've already always been there or they are coming more. And we have lots of uh, lizards and um, and and things like that. Um, and I actually don't I'm not familiar with this. So I don't know um, what they are. But um, anytime I go pottering around in the in the yard uh, underneath the mulches or behind um, uh, they're, they're lurking. So I think there is an increase in the, in the reptilian population as well. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna turn this program back over to Vivian. Thank you so much, uh, Johanna. And then and Pushkar and Mina, oh my gosh, your garden is amazing. I'm totally inspired and actually the, mallow and redbud question was mine because I have a similar problem and I'm glad to hear it's not unique to me and a challenge. Uh, before I turn it over to our next garden, I'm actually gonna take the screen again and just do a quick uh, little point of, uh, let me see if I can find this. I, uh, I, I just wanted to show how you can see uh, their garden. Let me see if I can get that. Um, on the website. So we, we've done this the past couple of weeks and I realized we didn't do it this week. Just a super quick tour of the GNGT site. So when you go to gngt.org, this is what you're going to see. And if you go to view the gardens, I'm going to go to Pushkar and Mina's garden, which is in Los Altos. So it's right here up at the top, the Hingley Sharma garden. And now you can have the, you can see the video by going down to this virtual tour menu. And then that video tour is right here. So you can see that at home. And then if you want to look at the plant list, just scroll to the very, very bottom of the display. And then you can see down here, it says click here, display the plant list in a printer friendly format. Click that list and you're gonna see the, the, all the plants that are in the garden. And this is true for all the gardens on the site. And that way it's easy to, to take a quick look if you have any questions later on about what you've been watching on the tour. 
And so now I'm going to turn it over to our next set of presenters. We have three master gardeners who are going to be showing us a public garden that you could actually go see yourself right now. And that is the San Carlos Native Plant Garden. And we have Melissa Mason, who has been a master gardener since 2015. She's the chair of the Master Gardener Member Education, and she's been interested in native gardening since 2017. Um, she's joined by Jeffrey Blake, who has been a master gardener since 2016, and he's been involved with a wide array of master gardener activities, including two years as the projects co-chair for the operations committee. He's also a community builder and he leads the mentor program for helping new master gardeners. He lives in Belmont near San Carlos and he's been involved with developing this garden since the very beginning. And our third master gardener is Carolyn Dorsch who has been involved with CMPS for over 20 years. She's a new master gardener. She just finished with the class of 2020. She's also into vegetable gardening She's a Bay Area native and she lives in Menlo Park. She has been a mainstay for our chapter. She was our, ch our chapter treasurer, a field trip chair. She is an amazing person. And I am going to turn it over to the three of you to show us the San Carlos Native Plant Garden. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Melissa. We're delighted to be here on this tour. Um, we, I've always loved this uh, garden tour and look forward to it every year. Uh, as mentioned, we are Master Gardeners, which uh, is a statewide program of UC, the UC educational system. We're a volunteer organization that uh, in short, we were charged with educating the public about gardening in a sustainable manner, research-based. And as part of our um, organization, we have projects. And this is one of the projects that we started last year. Um, where are we? Uh, just a little background of how we got started on this project. Uh, we had an existing uh, relationship with the city of San Carlos, Parks and Recreation. Uh, Amy was the director of, Amy Newby was the director of Parks and Recreation, and Louis Duran was the public works supervisor. And we had worked with them on a project right after the drought started or stopped. The, the planters in downtown San Carlos they had turned the water off for obvious reasons. So we had asked to work with the city to rebuild these planters with uh, drought tolerant plants. Uh, there are three blocks of uh, these rather large planters and one block we planted essentially succulents. Another block was uh, flowering drought tolerant plants. And the third block was natives. And part of that was to learn about the plants. We didn't know a lot about uh, natives at that time, and we wanted to see how they uh, performed in uh, containers. And once we kind of saw how they did, we got hooked and we started looking for a larger venue. Now, it turns out that just walking down the street was the San Carlos Library and uh, City Hall. And inside the library and City Hall was a um, a kind of a secluded uh, uh, park setting about seven to 8,000 square feet that's raised planter boxes. And we happened on this right when they had taken all of the succulents out and were just replanting it. And they were replanting it in very pretty commercial uh, plants. Uh, there was yellow daisy, spider plants, and uh, uh, status, purple status or C status. And we got to them just in time and said, we would love to make a, uh, a garden, a native garden, a habitat, an ecosystem, and really show how these plants um, are beneficial and beautiful and uh, whatnot. So they, we got there as fate has it just in time for them to cancel the rest of their plants. And here we are. This is the garden that we planted. Um, so the purpose of the garden, 
uh, was to, it, you know, it was, it was to really demonstrate, first we wanted a larger venue, and then we wanted to really demonstrate how beautiful these plants are. One of our, uh, one of the things we noticed is that the general public doesn't really know a lot about these plants and they, our goal was to show them that they could be beautiful and easy to take care of, low maintenance. And uh, here we go. I think in addition, um, in terms of the mission of uh, the Master Gardeners uh, to teach uh, uh, homeowners to plant sustainably, this is a, the demonstration garden we've been creating here is a perfect foil for that in terms of we're learning how to do it, but also it's in a public space. And uh, we plan to have uh, workshops and conversations around the whole process and give uh, people the tools to go home and create these spaces in the, at their home, in their own gardens. I think that's the thing that gets is really exciting with our signage, the plants, uh, interaction with the public. Uh, I think we can make a big difference. Yeah, and if, could I add as well, this is Carolyn speaking. I, I just, um, I'm the one trying to control the PowerPoint here. <laughs> I, you know, I was when I was reviewing the Master Gardener mission statement and goals, it reminds me also of the California Native Plant Society and goals. And I think, you know, they're both wonderful organizations. As Vivian mentioned, I've been a member of CNPS for a very long time, and I'm new to Master Gardeners, but I'm, you know, I'm familiar with them, seeing them in the community over the years. But I just, I really, it was nice to see that so many of these goals are shared goals, and it's just a great opportunity for for us to be working together with CNPS. And we are, um, you know, being a new garden, it's, it's, it's a brand new garden period. And then it's obviously a new garden for the tour. And we, um, you know, we do want to thank the, the committee for coming out and looking at the garden and inviting us to participate. I think we'll find that, you know, we really march, you know, kind of hand in hand with a lot of the CNPS uh, mission and goals as well. Anyway, back to uh, back to our slides here. <laughs> well, this is uh, our timeline, and um, I just want to. When you work with uh, uh, the city, um, the timeline is important because they don't. You got to coordinate all the different people, and in spring of 2019, that's when we kind of set up our plan. Uh, we had a garden design by the summer. We started planting in the fall, which was uh, lucky for us that, that that's the best time to plant. And uh, we had to change out the soil. We would have liked to have amended the soil and, and done some other things to the soil, but it just, there wasn't time to do that. We had irrigation installed in the fall. And um, now uh, we are in a position we just put in some la uh, plant labels and we are weekly uh, routinely maintaining deadheading uh, weeding and doing um, things on the garden now we plan when we get uh, released we plan to have weekly um, kind of a walk by table garden there while we're working in the garden people can walk by we can talk to them about the maintenance and that kind of thing this is an aerial view uh, of the garden and what made it so unique and really ideal for this particular native ecosystem was there's, it's quite long. You'll see there's a central um, patio and then there's walkways. Uh, the walkway, uh, this long walkway right there is about 90 feet long, six and a half feet of planting space on both sides. And that right now is our uh, very, very low water pollinator garden. And then as you kind of proceed up to the right, uh, in that little space um, by the stairwell there, that's our hummingbird garden. Um, and then across from the hummingbird garden, it's a very, uh, under the oak tree there, this big oak tree, we have a shade garden. And then to the left of the shade garden is a very large space. Those trees aren't there now. 
but it's a larger, very hot space that we did a larval host garden. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we kind of divided up the concept. Mm -hmm. I, I was also gonna add that this space is mostly above a parking structure. Yes, that's right. So there's underground parking for the town hall and the library. And so, you know, the parking structure, it, it, it's got some sort of seal, you know, there's a seal to the base of these planters and the planters, Melissa or Jeffrey, they're not very deep, right? We think a couple feet, maybe. Right, maybe. a couple feet. Yeah, yeah, maybe two feet. The other thing to note, which made this so ideal is these are uh, benches all the way around the whole uh, area. So you can sit and it also brings these flowers up. And you notice a lot of times the, the native plants are so delicate that you really have to kind of bend over to really appreciate the flowers. And in this, you walk along in their uh, eye, eye height. So you can really appreciate the delicacy of these, um, these plants. The other thing of note, up at the top under the oak tree, you can't see this, but there's a dog park down the down the street so this this actually uh this little park gets a lot of traffic the library is uh they go to and from the library and to and from town hall plus the dog uh park down the down the walkway yeah i'm just going to add that so the parking lot for the there's a small parking lot here for the library there's lots of there's street parking catches catch can so when people are coming into the library off of elm street when, when they walk in toward the library entrance, entrance, which is about here, they can see up this path and they can see stuff that's happening. So it's, it's just a lovely space with entrance here, a beautiful, this is a beautiful long entrance here. And then as Melissa mentioned, the dog park here, there's also another path that comes in here off of whatever that street is over here. So there's many ways to come into this um, space. Another key feature is the, uh, the water. The, there's a big giant water fountain, point that out, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. And uh, a new section of a, a little river that goes through a little, the other section across the pathway. Um, and uh, that hasn't been turned on for like 20 years. Uh, so they're gonna re, you know, that's been important to provide water to the space too. And it's gonna make it really look beautiful too. Okay, here's the this is a garden layout that uh, Melissa designed. It's not completely to scale, but it's, it started us to think about where, what kinds of plants go where. We looked at uh, what kind of shade uh, each area got, depending on the sun. And uh, the sun sort of comes th through almost up that path in the morning from the parking lot. And uh, there's obviously shade behind the big oak tree up in the top right. So that helped us uh, identify these sections that we sort of named, either the host garden, the butterfly garden, the hummingbird garden. That helped us visualize like what kinds of plants we should look at. Um, and I think that was really helpful. And this, this is uh, looking from uh, Elm Street up the 90 feet. Um, on the left, you see one of the succulents that they had taken out. This, this is when we came to uh, uh, ask the city, this is what it looked like. Uh, we asked the city to, if we couldn't plant this. So the big succulents, and there were a lot of baby succulents coming up and still are coming up, but this is uh, before kind of the long view where the very drought tolerant, low water, <clears throat> excuse me, um, pollinator garden is right now. And, and just to point out too, so here's this big oak tree that we saw in the, oops, oh golly, that we saw in the aerial view um, that, um, you know, it's gonna cast, a, there's quite a bit of shade with back over here. So here's that. And, and you know, these are manzanitas, these, they're natives. You know, I think they got taken out before we had too much of a say in it. Um, some of these manzanitas though, uh, the, say, you know, the, the planting that's been there for, I think quite a while, so there are still some, I believe, around the corner here and maybe some also around the corner here. But otherwise, they basically this whole 90 foot stretch got completely, everything removed. Yeah. So we and really started from scratch. And just while you're here, just for perspective, on the left, 
you see the, the half wall, that's the down driveway for the parking lot. So when we say this is the top of the parking lot at the underground parking lot, we're serious. When you put a shovel and dig a hole, you hit the, top, the bottom. <laughs> so we weren't, uh, it, it was going to be a challenge. It's always a challenge being in a commercial area, but this was a challenge because we didn't really know how the plants would do in the setting, so. And here's the stairwell on the right as well, so. Yeah, yeah. What's great about having a sort of a blank slate is that um, we could start from the beginning, see the process all the way through. And one of the first things we did was lay down uh, some new soil that uh, was a combination you can see on the screen there, it had a lot of pea gravel in it, which really surprised me, but it really gave the soil a lot of nice drainage, a lot of aeration in the soil. Uh, we put down about four to six inches of soil everywhere. Uh, the city did that, but we specified what soil went down. Uh, and we did that uh, before we laid in irrigation or mulch on top of, of that. Um, and one of the reasons, and what, one of the things we did was start to, to hydrate the soil to start um, the weeds to propagate so we could take them out before we, before we put mulch down and also to cultivate any um, microorganisms in the soil to get them started, keep them moving and uh, prepare the soil for uh, planting and also digging holes. So. And voila, this is that voila. view. Um, this is after the very low, uh, after we planted it with the very low water uh, pollinator garden. And you'll see that it has uh, the Blue Springs penstemon, uh, some uh, globe mallow, sages, the sea daisy. I'm not good with the uh, scientific names, <laughs> but, uh, and, and what's of note is when you see this view, it, it's nowhere where near as pretty as when you're in that garden. And it doesn't look it, when you, you're looking at these at eye level, they are just really brilliant. The color is, is pretty amazing. It's a beautiful garden. And, and we also have white alpinia. I think that's how you say it. The white sage, the ceremonial sage of the Native Americans that I have in my yard and it's never grown past two feet. And these, you, you don't see them right now, but they're six feet. They're, they're, they're huge right now. Well, I think we created the right combination of light and sun and soil and mulch. And uh, just visiting, you know, obviously we're not meeting down there as regularly as we did before the virus, but, but uh, in the last month, these plants must have grown two feet. And I go down every week or every couple of weeks, take some photos. Uh, but the transformation is amazing. I mean, if you have an established garden, maybe you don't notice it, but but we put these plants in as 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 babies almost, and um, how much they've grown is almost astonishing. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Let's see. So, well, we're getting a little behind time, so I think we might want to step it up a little. But um, I'll just do the next few slides if it's okay. Sure. So, so this is our this is that we call the kind of the patio view. This is that view, that round uh, point that I think we saw before, and this is. Um, yeah, this is a before view. As you can see, that there are some big succulents here. There's some. Uh, uh, I think coffee they're, berry. What, what, yeah. What was that again? Well, it's a coffee berry. Coffee berry. Coffee yeah. Berry. Coffee berry, and I think this shrub. I don't know. Oh, yeah. oh okay. That's the toyon. Okay, so those are still there, but all of these got taken out. The trees are here, still here, I believe. Are these trees still here? Those are yeah. an acacia tree. Yeah. Yeah, they're still there. So, so this is sort of our again our our our. our blank slate that we're going to be working with. And, and then this area right here is going to be the hummingbird section that we've talked about. Um, you know, we always kind of like to show the before, but to get to the after, it takes, you know, it takes a village, right? So you just have a few shots. So these are all master gardeners and different stages of doing things in the garden. Um, it, it's just been a really fun, you know, it's been a great experience, a lot of camaraderie. That's one thing about master gardeners. They have a lot of hands-on activities, you know, when, we don't have a pandemic. And so this is just a, a fraction of the folks that came out and helped on the various Tuesdays. And so this was mostly October through December, the plantings with some filling in, um, you know, subsequently. And kind of here's after, so the same patio kind of from across the way. 
and this is just the plants just getting started. So this would have been probably maybe early April or something like that. So here's our shady area. The, here's the oak tree. This is Coast Live Oak. So it's going to have shade year round. So we have a shady area. This is going to be our host section, which we'll get into shortly. And this is our hummingbird section. And this long 90 foot thing that we showed is kind of where the, our pollinator section. But there's a lot of overlap that we've certainly recognized. <clears throat> Uh, the other thing um, <clears throat> we have, the city has uh, provided these large posters for three of the sections. This is to start um, beautiful. Uh, this is a for the larval host butterfly section. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've just done a beautiful job. It hasn't gone to print yet, so it's, 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 but we at least have the proof. So this is what's going to go up and uh, it, uh, what we've already seen, interestingly enough, we do have pipevine in there. That's a pipevine swallow caterpillar up in the right-hand corner. But we have um, already seen the yellowtail, the, uh, what do we call this blue guy? You, you mm -hmm. mentioned the white ones, but yeah. we have seen um, the painted ladies. We are starting to see more fauna show up. It's pretty amazing. The bug load immediately was, you could, you could notice it. But um, the habitat section, we have ceanothus in it. We have, um, what else we have? Uh, coffee berry, lots of um, buckwheat. Well, we can take a look at the pictures, Melissa. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's the uh, larval host area. This is it kind of grown in where you see the uh, lots of berries. The ceanothus will produce the uh, nutlets and and um, the coffee berries and the yarrow and what else did we put there? Yeah. Buckwheat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have milkweed, pipevine, as I said. Uh, we have mallow. Yeah. They're they're. Uh, and they're all listed on the uh, plant list, but it's, um, and, and what the, the other thing is we found, we lost very few plants, very few. And it's, it's, that's amazing. Yeah, part of the reason for that is we, the plants got in before the irrigation system, unfortunately. So we had to hand water and I think someone asked in an earlier garden, well, what did you do in February? Well, you know, we definitely watered in February. February. I think there was like a 33 or 34 day period where there was no rain. At some point the irrigation system has gone in, but be, being a new garden, new plants, you, you know, the, we, we can't just solely rely on the irrigation system. So Melissa, you know, lugs this huge long hose <laughs> and special equipment to access the, um, the secure water system for the uh, the garden, and so we supplement it with hand watering still. Well, and that's just since you brought it up. The one thing you learn when you work commercially is that there's no spigots to to hook a hose up to. You have to have the commercial uh, connectors, and so uh, we that was a number one thing. You cannot put a garden in without an ability to put a hose in. So we insisted when they were putting the uh, irrigation in that we had access because plants go in at different times and they need more water than the drip system um, can put in and, and that was that that's really saved us what's really nice we put in extra controller water controllers for each of the sections and and access to the um, to the water you have to have a special little nozzle to hook in to water but we have all that and then we can water different sections differently right. and have access all right. So, uh, Jeffrey, you're the hummingbird guy. I'm the hummingbird guy because <laughs> I like to take pictures of hummingbirds. Um, but I, I think that what's really exciting is that uh, when the signage, the signage seems large, but they're, they're, they tell a story. Um, the areas tell a story. And we have a lot of this educational signage going up. And that really helps our mission in terms of uh, attracting people that walk by all the time. You can stop and talk to them, and uh, everybody is interested. But uh, we're learning how to convey this information to the public, how to uh, give them information, maybe through workshops later, where they can go home and make a uh, hummingbird garden themselves. Because we have plant lists uh, specified. We're building a database. Uh, so somebody could go to a workshop and 
and get a plant list just for hummingbirds. Well, and I have to mention for the hummingbirds, and this is the hummingbird section, I have to give a shout, a shout out to Arvind Kumar. I hope I said that right. But I, when I was looking up what plants to do, his article on year-round uh, plants for a hummingbird garden popped up, and it, it features three plants each in, of, for three seasons. So the article talks about put these three plants in, three of each one. So a total of nine different plants, three of each, 27 plants. I said, I'm not researching any further. He knows what he's doing and we put it in. With a few exceptions, there may have been one or two plants we couldn't find, so we, we got a substitute, but these plants are phenomenal for a couple reasons. One, they're very green. So for new people that don't understand, you know, that think there is a perception that native gardens are dry and kind of grassy. When you look at this garden, it's not dry and grassy at all. It's got the uh, hummingbird sage, the uh, California fuchsia, the flowering currant, mm -hmm. these woolly blue curls are, are great. And it's a very lush, you, yeah. uh, a very yeah. lush area when you see it. I highly recommend looking, it's beautiful. If we make it to the end of the presentation, we do have a link to um, Arvind's article that Melissa is referring to. And Arvind, as many know, was uh, CNPS president, uh, past president, and a, a while back. And he's been, you know, very, very active in CNPS and the Going Native Garden Tour and starting the symposium, just a whole bunch of things. So and, and he's got a lot of things he's written, and some of the talks are on video that are on our YouTube channel. So let's see, and the pollinator. Who wants to do, Melissa, you want to talk about this? Pollinator, that, this is the one that we showed, the 90 feet of very, very low water uh, dr uh, drought tolerant natives, and it's a buzz. These, we have the monkey flowers and the, I think that might be the black sage, but uh, don't quote me on that. And we have the pink uh, yarrow. It's, a, it's in full bloom now. And in fact, next Tuesday, we're gonna go out and do some, uh, maintenance on them, but it's, it's that, that globe mallow is beautiful and the sea daisy, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can get it. Do you see how the globe mallow is just in full bloom? It's beautiful. Yeah, I labeled it as desert mallow, but it's just gorgeous. I think this yeah. was in some of the other gardens that we saw as well. It's just, it's just yeah. stunning. Um, and you know, the plants were really <laughs> small and they yeah. came off. it's just crazy. Okay, so we gotta keep kind of keep moving here. Um, the shade section, I guess I can mention it. Uh, I think, so this, so our shade section, we call it, is sort of this area behind here, you know, underneath where the oak tree is, there's a fence. It gets pretty shady. So, you know, we, we obviously had to do, we wanted to put natives in and we, you know, we had to do something that was going to work in the shade. Um, so here's just some of our volunteers hard at work. So these are some of the plants that we have in there right now. I think we, you know, we probably will fill in with some more later. I think there we got some good ideas from some of the earlier um, shows today that we were chatting about. In ter so we may, you know, we'll be adding to it, but we, we put some ferns in, a giant chain fern, which isn't giant yet. Um, I think we have deer fern in there. I, uh, Yerba Buena is kind of sweet. This is this little flower, uh, Doug Iris. And there's other things in there, but um, that probably needs a little bit more developing, I think. It's been slow in developing a bit. <laughs> well, the shade garden also grows slower. Right. The yeah. other thing, um, let me just, uh, <clears throat> I had mentioned the challenges of being in a commercial area and the, the challenging, the challenges really are about uh, the water and the traffic. And so one of the things we found is the dog park, as I said, was around the corner. And what would happen is the homeowners would allow their dogs to jump up in the garden. They, they held them on the leash, but they marked their territory. And we had to quickly come up with some way to uh, remind them that this is a new planting and the dog parks around the corner. So we put up these signs and it, for the most part, I think it's doing doing its job. Um, we had deer up front that were eating all the plants, but these are all now, the deer aren't bothering anybody. Mm -hmm. And we find an occasional football in there or a <laughs> basketball, but, or a child. But um, it, those are the, the main things that um, have been a challenge in as the water, I'll just bring up when you're commercially in the water, you can't just say, call up uh, the city and say, you know, turn it up on zone three. 
you, <laughs> you send an email and you, that's why we wanted the hand watering is so that we could hold, you know, do the hand watering until they were able to turn up the zone. So it's been wonderful working with the city. They have been just tremendous. And uh, this park shows what a, a great collaboration this has been. Well, I think too, it's, yeah, the city's been behind this from the very beginning and, mm -hmm. you know, they're getting an interest in what they do in some of their other public spaces with the native plants. And so this is an opportunity to, you know, help uh, the city with their planning, looking at this native garden and seeing that, hey, these are some things that they can put in some of the other parks and other spaces. Some of the staff has come out, they, they, they did the initial digging of all the holes. We, we put we put pots where we wanted, you know, empty pots where we wanted the plants to go. And cause you know, they dug, I don't know, 120 holes. I mean, you know, sometimes we had to, move, we figured later, oh, we need to move the hole and move it. But they've come out a few times in the staff and the crew coming out and, and giving us a hand with some of the, uh, the heavy work or some other things. So, uh, you know, Amy Newby is the director of Parks and Rec and she's been super helpful. Um, we've met with her, she's the one that, um, is working with uh, us and the graphic designer and <coughs> those three big signs so it's just a wonderful collaboration and, and, and Lewis Moran he's the superintendent of the public works his it's his guys and they also have used our uh plant list to uh use these plants in some of the other public spaces so it, it's starting to do what what we intended it to do to show people that these are wonderful workhorses and there's a place for them in our parks and homes and more volunteers. Yeah, I just had to, I, I love taking pictures of people in the garden doing different things. Um, these are some of the city guys that were helping us out and uh, I, you know, the plants lined up. I mean this, you know, well people putting in a, a garden from scratch. It's not like my home garden. Well, I get a few plants at a time and just do it in pieces. You know, this had to be the whole thing had to be done at once. So I, you know, just looking back in these pictures, I, I, I can't, you know, it really was a lot. It really has been more work than I, I remember, you know, and I like this. And it's remarkable how bare, barren it was. This is six months later, we've got six foot tall uh, natives. It's, it's pretty amazing. This is the hummingbird garden. And, I, and to me, this is what it's all about. A beautiful space. This is the library in the background. Um, somebody just sitting here re enjoying the garden space. It's, it's just, it really is just a lovely place. And we, we already have seen hummingbirds. They've come in. This is, remember, this is Arvin's garden. It was beautifully and very green. It's a beautiful garden. And, and our future plans, you know, like all gardeners, you're always thinking ahead. This, this turkey vulture was actually flying over the garden. So this is part of the tour, seeing this uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, not only is looking down at the plants, but he's looking up in the sky and he, and he caught this great image. And as we've talked about a lot of these things, I think in our future plans, we wanna get the water, get, hopefully work with the city to get that water feature up and running. So um, maybe we can then have to put in some meadow plants in that area, you know, master gardeners are always about uh, outreach. So outdoor classes, doing propagation, plant clinics, more collaboration with the city. Yeah. And the other thing, I think virtually every one of these plants is considered easy to grow. So it, these are all doable. Yeah. And just th this is that uh, last page that, you know, just a couple, just a couple of acknowledgements are probably, probably left out folks. Um, definitely uh, Amy, she's been helpful. And, and I didn't, I didn't have, Lou, I should have put Luz in, in, in here too. I left that out. Obviously the California Native Plant Society, the, the Santa Clara Valley chapter, Here's the article that Ar Ar uh, Arvin wrote. And we did use Calscape, which is um, a CNPS horticultural site for getting a lot of information on, you know, what, what the plants, how they grow, how big are they gonna get? And just, you know, I think uh, Vivian did an introduction on May 2nd on how to use Calscape, I believe. And it's just a wonderful tool that we keep going back to over and over again. There you go. Yeah, and this is, and this is all Master Gardener talks end with, uh, a question a thing and um, just it's just a little plug for master gardeners they do have a, a helpline where you can email questions and they have a helpline they normally have office hours but they're actually all closed right now but if anybody has any questions any time of the year about anything native plants gardening 
we do have a helpline and people can do the research. So just thought I'd point that out. Good job. Yeah. Well, thank you. So you ready for some questions? Yes. Okay, first one up. Can you name a few larval host plants, please? Certainly. <clears throat> Ceanothus is a huge one. The pipe, Dutchman pipe vine is the one, uh, and if you look it up, I think the San Francisco Botanical Garden has, uh, <clears throat> well, what's his name, Wang? But uh, they, they, the pipe vine swallow is this beautiful neon blue um, butterfly. And the San Francisco, in conjunction with the botanical garden, has single-handedly repopulated San Francisco with that particular butterfly. Uh, the, um, let me think, uh, globe mallow. Mm -hmm. We have a Fremont mallow in the back, three of them, and that's a host plant. The toyon is, the coffee berry, the, um, what else do we have? Asters. The, your, big, your big host plants are your oak trees, your number one sustainer of life. Your sunflower or aster family is huge for um, host plants. And Ceanothus is one of your bigger um, plants that hosts, who else? Uh, yeah, and some of the buckwheats, you know, to, uh, there's actually, uh, you know, I'm kind of looking at the, of about 65 plants that we have listed on the, the list that you can access through the GNGT site. Over half of them are, you know, listed as host plants to, uh, to some extent, you know, some are, um, where more with the lar the larvae are eating directly on the plant, but other ones, you know, um, like the epilobium, you know, that they're listed as host plants as well. Uh, the salvias, I don't mean I don't think of them necessarily as host plants, but they're listed as host plants in the um, in Calscape. So um, we focused on some of the the perennials um, in that host section, as Melissa mentioned. I think we got, we've got milkweed started, but it's it's kind of a small section and. You know, normally you want a little bit larger patch, so I don't expect much this year, but maybe in years to come. Yeah. But I, I think, like you say, the coffee berry, the ceanothus, the, the huge oak, it's a pretty good sized oak tree there um, are definitely. Well, and if you go to Calscape, what I did is I looked up uh, native uh, San Mateo County butterflies, and then I looked at the plants that are their host plants. And we have at least 25 plants that are host to native butterflies and moths. Right. But the Calscape is a wonderful source for it. Yeah. I think Thank that's you. amazing is the thinking about the plants and then what 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 creatures live in them or rely on them. It's not just a plant you're putting in. It's the whole habitat, the ecosystem that makes this really marvelous. Yeah. And definitely a buzz with insects. It is amazing. Yeah, I wanted to put up a sign that says, build it and they will come. <laughs> Before I ask the next question, um, could one of you please type the two references into the chat? Uh, I believe it's probably the Arvin article oh. so that they can cut and paste it. And then I'll ask the next question, okay? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go okay. ahead and do it, but I'm gonna, I might be- Show it maybe, right? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, next question um, regarding the soil. Did you mix any of the existing soil back in? And then also, do you have any advice on pre prepping for new planting? Well, what, um, what we did, uh, they brought in four to six inches and we had them dig it into the existing soil, which was very sandy, if I recall. It was so dry because it hadn't been. So they, they did dig it in and we, uh, that was all the prepping we did, to be honest. Um, Native plants don't need a huge amount of nutrition. And in fact, sometimes they don't do as well when the soil's too healthy. So uh, this Lingso is where we got this particular uh, soil, which is called essential soil. It is just, I have had great um, luck with this, this soil, but that's all I have done. I don't know of... Um, that's, yeah, I don't do anything else. The city you? did uh, till a little bit uh, yeah. in some spaces that didn't dig up roots or something. 
Uh, I think that was a good good start. And normally we don't recommend super tilling to sort of disrupt the cell. This sort of needed it to start and uh, starting fresh. And as we go forward, obviously we're not going to retill the store soil, but there's some mixture that went in. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Next question. When the water feature is working again, um, will you have any concerns with raccoons? <laughs> well, we did plant it so they would come. We'll put them <laughs> on our list of visitors. I mean, it, why not? I don't think we thought that far, to be perfectly honest, but it is, you know, in a totally urban area with residential housing uh, and multifamily housing um, nearby. So, and there's also a creek um, just a block or two away um, that, you know, that's open in some part. And so then it gets underground in others. So, you know, that I guess that's something to think about. Um, well, I guess put it, we'll put it on our, you know, on our radar. I don't, I don't have, do you have a problem with raccoons? They're usually at night when no one's around. Are well, you, they might dig things up or the looking for things. I mean, I don't know. It just depends how wet the, the feature will be. I'm guessing it won't be super wet. So I don't know. We'll have to see how, if we can really do a meadow, if we can pull it off or not, or, you know, we'll, we'll just have to play that one by ear, but we'll keep it in mind. I hadn't, hadn't crossed my mind. Yeah. I don't believe there are any more questions, and I think we're coming up to the top of the hour, if you, unless you had some final remarks. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Vivian, so I thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to thank you, too. That was amazing. It was really inspirational to see how much you've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time, and I'm definitely going to be driving up to San Carlos sometime soon to see that. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to just plug the Master Gardeners in general because it's uh, you, all, you all are with the San Mateo, but Santa Clara Master Gardeners are actually one of the co-sponsors of our tour. And in fact, I don't think it would be possible to have the tour without all the volunteer work that the Santa Clara Master Gardeners have done with it. So Master Gardeners is amazing organization and they just do you guys do just so much to help everybody learn and and to contribute these kind of wonderful gardens it's 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 wonderful so i i just wanted to say thank you and plug it for everybody to know about um anyways i we are wrapping up we are out of pretty much out of time uh our i think we've had some really great presentations and and views of gardens and i think live format has been wonderful and being able to connect directly with the people behind the gardens which in the physical garden tours you often don't get a chance to do that so I'm excited that even though we're all stuck at home that we actually have a way of connecting with each other and learning more and then we can all go and use this wonderful information on our own gardens and uh, just a reminder that we have another one of these live sessions coming up in June, on June 13th. Um, and that one will be in the evening starting at seven o'clock. So I hope that we'll see you guys, everybody again, tell your friends about it. It's, uh, I think these are really fun. So I, I appreciate everyone putting in all the effort and, uh, and joining us. So goodbye, have a great weekend and uh, happy gardening. <laughs> Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.